This morning we continue with our series through the book of Joshua. Our text for today is Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 through 21. Again, that's Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Uh, would you join me now in standing for the reading of God's word? I'll read our text in its entirety. When I finish reading the text, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, at which point I would appreciate very much if you would respond by saying, thanks be to God. One final time, our text for today is Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. The Bible says this, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan of Sihon and Og whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you, as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. This is the word of the Lord. All right, please be seated. Let's begin. There's three primary points that I hope by the grace of God to make from the text today. The second point will be the primary point of the sermon. The first and the third will be smaller points, yet, of course, still significant. The first thing, as we see in the text today, worth noting is this, that trusting in God's promised outcome is vital, and trusting in God's promised outcome comes before actually having a plan. Now, we should trust God 
in God's covenant promises. What God says will come to pass. What God says will be the outcome, even if we don't see the means by which this is going to come about. Trusting in God's promised outcome, even before having a plan. Verse 1 of our text says this, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim, as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. Now, Joshua's insistence, this is easy to miss, but Joshua's insistence on secrecy, go and secretly spy out the land, was not so much with respect to the inhabitants of Jericho. This is assumed of all spies. Joshua is not merely saying, you should go and spy secretly as to ensure that Jericho does not detect your presence. You should be secret in respect to the inhabitants of Jericho. Jericho, the ones who you are spying out. That would be redundant. The mere fact that he is sending them as spies assumes that they should exercise secrecy in regards to the people of Jericho. Rather, Joshua is insisting that these spies exercise secrecy in regards to the people of Israel. In regards to the spies conducting their business in a private manner, this is to be not discovered by the people of Israel. Why? See, Joshua is concerned that Israel might be discouraged if they suspected that Joshua, as their leader, was fearful of the Canaanites. Joshua was careful not to appear distrusting of the promise of God that was given to them that they might conquer the land. And this is a good principle for all people in positions of leadership not to scare those who are following you. This is good counsel, good biblical counsel for all positions of leadership, whether it be church leadership, whether it be civil magistrates, whether it be uh, somebody who is a superior or employer in a vocational field, and especially parents in regards to their children. We trust the promises of God, and we trust these promises without having a plan. So Joshua believed that God would fulfill what he had promised, that he would give the land of Canaan over to Israel, that they would be given strength to conquer all their enemies. Jericho was one of the strongest and most fortified cities in the land of Canaan. And Joshua is not sending the spies to see whether or not Jericho um, is weak enough for God to actually make good on his promise. No, rather, he's sending the spies to see, to see what the means will be that God utilizes to bring about his promised end. Joshua is trusting that the end result is that Jericho will be conquered. But Joshua is sending spies into the land to detect the practical means by which this will come about. What are the particular weak points of this city of Jericho. How are we going to conquer it? Not if we'll conquer it. God has promised that. We trust his promise, but we want to see how it's going to be conquered. And so Joshua sends these spies secretly, not secretly in regards to the inhabitants of Jericho, hence the fact that they're spies. That's assumed. But he's secretly sending them out in regards to the knowledge of Israel. He doesn't want Israel to be aware that Joshua is sending spies out to detect weak points, points of vulnerability with their enemies at Jericho, because he doesn't want that action to be interpreted by his own people, by the people of Israel, as distrust in the covenant promises of God. Now, the reason you might wonder, well, why is he sending the spies out at all? God's going to come through with his promise. Well, that's because you know the end of the story. All right? This is one of the most commonly known stories in the whole of Scripture. All right? we, we, before Phil Vischer went woke, you know, you got veggie tales, right? The people at Jericho, you know, and the walls come down. I mean, every child, even children not raised in a Christian family, are probably aware of the walls of Jericho crumbling. But Joshua and Israel weren't. Not at this moment. So they're not doubting. Joshua's not doubting whether or not God will fulfill his promise. He's asking how. This is similar to the Virgin Mary. Right? There are instances where God gave a promise. Right? Perhaps he even sent an angel 
Um, and the person did not believe the promise, and there was a judgment for their unbelief. Uh, think of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah, who was serving as a priest, that he goes into the Holy of Holies to perform his priestly duty, and it is spoken to him by the Lord through a messenger that he's going to have a son, and that this son is going to pave the way, make straight the paths, level every mountain, raise every valley for the Messiah, that he's going to have a son, namely John the Baptist, who would be a forerunner of Jesus. And Zechariah questions this in unbelief. Now listen, here's the distinction. Not unbelief in how God could bring this about in terms of what God's means will be in fulfilling the promise, but Zechariah actually doubts God's ability to fulfill the promise at all. And so he is stricken with muteness. He becomes dumb and unable to speak, dumb in the proper sense. He's unable to speak until the birth of the child. Now Mary, on the other hand, by way of contrast, the same kind of event happens for her where an angel comes and says, blessed are you. This is what the Lord is going to do for you. That you will conceive by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will come upon you and you will conceive a son. And his, his name shall be Jesus. And, and she receives this message. Her response is not, um, uh, I don't see how God can, uh, could pull this off. In terms of the how referencing, I don't know how this is possible. AKA, I don't know if God can do it. No, her question of how has to do with not, is God capable of the end of his promise, fulfilling the end of his promise, but her question of how is in regards to what particular means will he use to bring about the end of his promise. Mary is not doubting whether or not God can pull it off. When she asks, how can this be? She's literally asking, she's not saying it cannot be, or I don't think it can be. She's saying, essentially, it will be because the Lord has spoken. But I'm a virgin, and practically, from just a scientific perspective here, I'm just wondering how that's going to work. Right? That's very different than Zechariah. That's very different than other individuals. It's different than Sarah, Abraham's wife, who laughs. She laughs at the promise that she would bear a son in her old age. That's, that's, that wasn't, I don't know how God can bring this about, but I'm sure he will. That was, I'm doubting whether or not he can bring this about. That's the difference. And so from the very first verse of our text, Joshua, I do not believe, is doubting the promise of God in terms of the end result. Jericho will be conquered. The land of Canaan will be given as a promise to God's people, as an inheritance. But rather, he's sending out these two spies because he knows God's going to bring it about, but he doesn't know what means by which God will bring it about. And he knows that he's going to have to do something. He's, it's, it's not just that God is going to bring it about without any participation from his people. That his people will have to step out in faith. It won't just be sitting on the other side of the Jordan believing and trusting and hoping and wishing. They're going in faith. Faith brings about, it necessitates action. True faith is living faith, and living faith works. It is a working faith. Now, we are not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by faith alone, but the true faith that actually saves produces both salvation and works. The simplest way I can explain it is like this. Think of it as a simple um, arithmetic addition, mathematic equation. It is not faith plus works equals God coming through with his promise, a.k.a. salvation. It is not faith plus works equals salvation. It is faith equals salvation plus works. Do you see the difference? It is not faith plus works gets you salvation. No, it is faith alone, but as Luther once said, a faith that is truly alone, a true saving faith, it is faith alone that saves, but true faith is never alone. Faith alone saves, but true faith is never alone. So it's not faith plus works equals salvation. That's a heresy. That is uh, the heresy of legalism proper. That's, that's the Galatian heresy. Adding works to the flesh 
to faith. What you have begun by the Spirit, you now seek to perfect by works as done unto the, uh, by the flesh. That is, that is to insult the sufficiency of Christ. To say that what Christ did is pretty good. It's a great start. But, but it's not enough. Right? That at the end of the day, God fulfilling his promise is, is really a beautiful picture of teamwork makes the dream work. You know, Jesus really did a lot. But man, when I came in there also, and we teamed up, me and Jesus, we got it done. That's a heresy. That's a joke. It's la you laughed? Great response. You've been discipled well, if I do say so myself. Laughter is the proper response, right? It's, it's laughable. However, here's where evangelicals today miss it. The problem with evangelicalism today is not that it is in great danger of legalism. The problem with evangelicalism today is that it hates God's law. It is antinomian. Even with the whole Christian nationalist thing, I am convinced even dear brothers, not saying they're not saved, not saying they're false teachers, I think they're confused. I've been confused. I'm sure I'm still confused about things. And if I knew what they were, then I probably wouldn't be confused. That's how confusion works. Right? So I'm confused about things. Other dear brothers are confused about things. Doesn't make them heretics. Doesn't make them not brothers. But I, I have a sneaking suspicion that when you get down to the bottom, and this is speculation, and I'll own that, right? Man looks at the outward appearance. God alone sees the heart. I'm speculating about motives here, and I could be wrong. So let me give that disclaimer. But I have a sneaking suspicion that even with some of the dearest brothers that I know, faithful men, that the aversion towards having a Christian nation is somehow tied to an aversion towards God's law. At the end of the day, they just don't like God's law. Or at the end of the day, they're at least somewhat ashamed of God's law. Like we like most of God's law. We like the second table of God's law. Commandments number five through 10. We'll take that. Love your neighbor. We'll, we'll, we'll run that play as evangelicals back and forth all day for three years for, you know, the whole uh, Branch Covidian thing. You know, we'll, love your neighbor, love your neighbor, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. We'll, we'll proudly champion some of God's law. But when, the moment we start talking about Sabbatarian laws, which is not crazy, that was in our nation. We're not talking about a hypothetical situation that's never been done. We're talking about our own nation's recent history. But the moment you start talking about the Sabbath, you're like, well, well, we would never do that. That's extreme. We're not extreme. We're not, we're not those extreme Christians. Like what, what extreme? You mean every single Christian there's ever been until 15 minutes ago? They were all Sabbatarian. The extreme Christians, you mean the Puritans? But you hosted the Puritan conference. Let's think about that for a second. Who are you calling extreme? Blasphemy laws are extreme. We already have them. It's not whether, but which. There will always be in any nation a God. Every nation is theocratic. Every nation has a God. It's either a pagan God, the state as God, or the triune God. And based on their God, a theocracy, that's, for the record, that's not an ecclesiocracy. An ecclesiocracy is a conflation of two independent, autonomous, sovereign spheres, namely church and state. Ecclesiocracy seeks to blend those two, conflate them together. That is not biblical. That's not what anyone is arguing for. An ecclesiocracy would be a church-run state. A theocracy is a God-run state. Separation of church and state, amen. The scepter was given to Judah and the priesthood to Levi. Even in the first book of the Bible, we see God separating, designating separately these duties of church and state. Civil rulership, Judah, the scepter given to them, and the priestly functions, the church, given to Levi. The separation of church and state is perfectly biblical, and I advocate for it strongly. But brothers and sisters, there is night and day difference between the separation of church and state and the separation of Christ and state. Every state, every nation, every government is theocratic. Ecclesiocracy, no thank you. No Protestant pope. 
Theocracy, it's not whether but which. You have no choice in the matter. It will be theocratic. We currently, our nation has a God. And the particular God that we have, with whatever God you have, that God will have a, a corresponding orthodoxy. And anything outside of that orthodoxy, which is set by your God, anything outside of that is what you would consider blasphemy. So there are certain things you cannot say because it's not keeping in step with the reigning orthodoxy, which has been set by that nation's designated God. Not whether, but which. They have a God. Now with that, not only does the God then dictate orthodoxy, everything outside of that being blasphemy, but also all religions, and atheism is a religion, secular humanism is a religion, Darwinism is a religion, and it takes far more nonsensical, illogical faith to believe those false religions than it does to, to believe the true Christian religion. But every religion, not only does it have a God, an orthodoxy, outside of orthodoxy, therefore being blasphemy, but they also have sacraments. Our nation currently, the sacraments is the blood of babies, and the murder of 65 million plus children, and it's far more than that. And another sacrament is the sexual revolution, perversion. Now, we often make the correlation with Planned Parenthood to Molech, a false god, child sacrifice. But another correlation that's a helpful one the Gehardus Voss talks about is the Asherah poles. Molech, child sacrifice, think abortion. The Asherah poles were once fruitful trees. Trees have branches. But the Asherah poles were stripped of their branches down to a naked, bare pole. The branches and their ability to be fruitful is dismantled. They become lifeless, fruitless, androgynous. Molech, abortion. Asherah, transgenderism. Sexual mutilation. All fruitfulness ripped away. A shell of a person. A pole where a tree once stood. We have sacraments, not whether but which. We have orthodoxy, not whether but which. We have blasphemy laws, not whether but which. Because we have a God. Not just a private God for private individuals in their private lives. But there is always a public God of every public nation. They're all theocratic. Not whether, but which. Greg Bonson had an old speech. And a portion of that, about two and a half minutes long, has circulated and gone viral on the internet several times over the last few decades. But it's him responding to Westminster Escondido, which is a Presbyterian seminary known for their radical two-kingdom theology, very pietistic, everything is private, no public Christianity. And he's responding to them right after they tried to essentially silence him and fire him and remove him and dismiss him and humiliate him for his stance on Christian ethics, general equity theonomy. Theonomy simply being a word for God's law. And in this clip, I can't repeat it for you verbatim, but essentially what he says is this. He says, we have millions of children being murdered in the womb. And you're concerned about theonomy? You have to lock your windows at night. And you're concerned about theonomy? Children are being shot in schools. And you're worried about theonomy? Sodomy is being publicly praised in the streets of our nation. And you're concerned and worried about theonomy. Brothers and sisters, this was, this was 20, 30 years ago. What do you think Bonson would say today? Do you know why churches like ours are growing? 
Do you know why people signed up and sold out six months in advance the Theonomy and Postmillennialism Conference? Do you know why Christian nationalism was trending on Google two days ago? Partly because of my Twitter account. That's part of it. I certainly helped, helped it get into that spot. But beyond just uh, my own personal obsession, um, you know why these things are on the rise? People are considering because the world has gone insane. Bonson was a prophet, North, Gary North, R.J. Rushdoony. These guys were, they were prophets. And they did amazing things in their lifetime, amazing theological work, and an amazing practical faithfulness and obedience. Rushdoony did so much when it comes to private Christian education, so much um, in, in, in the legal sphere, so much was done by these guys. But ultimately, the evangelical church dismissed their message. And I think in part because they were prophets. Uh, the prophets always are killed. And here's the thing. The prophets aren't killed by the enemies of God. They're killed by God's people. Israel kills the prophets. And today, the evangelical church kills the prophets. But why are these ideas back on the rise? Why are people now willing to give it a second consideration? Because it's not whether but which. And when the world loses its mind, and people are genuinely afraid, and rightfully so, for the safety of their children and their grandchildren, then all of a sudden, considering, well, maybe God's law is not a horrible idea. All of a sudden, people are maybe a little bit more open to that. A little bit more open. All that back to Joshua. All that back to the how, means versus end, there were individuals throughout the scripture who doubted the end, whether or not God could actually fulfill his promise. But there are others who merely just were questioning, not from a place of pride or a place of unbelief, but merely questioning, how will you pull this off? I know you will, but how? And I think that's what we're seeing in the very first verse of our text, using Matthew Henry, using John Gill, other commentaries that I explored this week in preparation for the sermon today, they would agree. The secrecy is in regards to Israel, not in regards to the inhabitants of Jericho. That would be redundant. That would be unnecessary. They're spies. Of course they need to be secret. But what's unique is that Joshua is saying they should be secret as they go to spy out this land in regards to not being detected by their own people. Because Joshua, as a good leader, doesn't want the people of Israel to think even for a moment that he, as now the recent successor of Moses, their new leader, that he is distrusting of the promises given through Moses that they would, in fact, inherit the land. Joshua is simply thinking, not can God do it, but how will God do it? Because walking around the city and shouting had not yet occurred to him which is pretty fair. It would not have occurred to me. I, I, I sit here in my position of, of being above the story, seeing the end and looking at it from, you know, being able to see the forest and not just individual trees. You and I, we have the whole story. So like, Joshua, what's wrong with you? You don't need spies. Everyone knows the way you take down a city is you walk. Right? Maybe you do a little shouting. And if you have some shofars, you go ahead and, you know, you let those bad boys blow. Right? We know that. It's pretty understandable that Joshua did not. But good leaders, back to the first point here, good leaders don't scare those who are following them. They are diligent and careful not to display any sense of cowardice. They, they have faces of flint. As we saw last week, I used the quote from King Loon, the king of Archenland, and the horse and his boy, the Narnia series. He says, for this is what it means to be king, to be first in every desperate attack, to be last in every desperate retreat. And when there are hard times in the land, as there are sure to be in some years, to dress in finer clothes, 
and laugh more loudly over a scanty meal than any other man in the kingdom. That's what it means to be king. Kings fight, they feast, and they laugh. We don't want to be fearful warriors. We do not want to be jaded warriors, angry warriors. We want to be jovial warriors, laughing warriors. Jericho, the hearts of the people melted like wax because they knew that they had the advantage position, the high ground, fortification, artillery, plans of defense. But Israel had the Lord. The Lord is on our side. If God be with us, who can be against us? Which brings us to our second point. Fear is not only a sin. Biblically speaking, fear especially in a corporate sense, when a group of people, not just an individual, but a group of people, a nation, a culture, a community, when fear falls upon them, not only is fear in biblical terms a sin, but it's a curse. Fear is a sign that a people has been corporately placed by God under judgment. In your notes, I've written this. In verse 9 of our text, Rahab says, The fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. And again, in verse 11 of our text, Rahab says, And as soon as we heard it, heard what? The context is that you pass through the Red Sea, that God supernaturally caused it to part and open up as dry land and that you devoted to destruction and conquered and overcame the two kings, two other tribes of the Amorites. You've already conquered. So you've been given supernatural power and provision by God to cross through seas and not only to cross through seas, but to conquer kings. And the news of it, when we heard it, she says, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. One of the chief evidences which caused Rahab to be convinced that her people were the bad guys, right? Have you ever seen like, you know, the, are we the baddies? <laughs> you know, like, like Third Reich, like, are we the bad guys? Right, one way that you can tell, are we the baddies? Are we the bad guys? One way you can tell is when you and all your people are afraid. We don't think of fear as being morally indicting. It is. We make certain allowances for fear. We deal much more compassionately with the sin of fear. We don't like pride. We won't tolerate pride. Now, to be fair, we tolerate very much pride in ourselves. But as C.S. Lewis once said, pride is one of the most difficult sins to see in yourself and perhaps the most helpful indicator to know if you have pride yourself is to see how bothered you are by what you perceive as pride in others. Right? When a person is constantly going around and like, man, I'm just concerned about this guy's I, his, his humility. I'm just concerned about his pride. This guy seems arrogant. You know right then and there, that dude's really prideful. The guy voicing the concern about everybody else's humility, that's the person who's really prideful. Essentially what he's saying, you usually say that about people when they're getting some, some notoriety. Some sense of public recognition. I'm just concerned that he stay humble. And what you're actually doing is you're confessing that if you were getting that notoriety, you'd be an arrogant jerk. That's what you're actually doing. You're not voicing a concern. You're actually voicing subconsciously a personal confession. I wouldn't be able to handle that position. I'm so prideful. Right now, the only thing that keeps me humble is that nobody knows me, you know, and what I've done and is cheering for me except for my mom. And in God's providence, he'll keep it that way. Out of mercy and love for you. Because you're arrogant. You would not be able to handle status. You would not be able to handle notoriety. Who are you to judge another man's servant? A wise man, namely the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul once said. So, all that being said, fear 
right? We tolerate pride. That's how I got there. We tolerate, or we don't tolerate pride in others. We tolerate it in ourselves, but there are certain sins that, that we have very little compassion for. When we see pride and arrogance in someone else, we have a great aversion towards it. It gets under our skin. We're not patient. We're not tolerant. But one sin, and it is, brothers and sisters, biblically defined, objectively, definitively, a sin is fear. And we deal kindly and softly with fear. The mortification of sin, John Owen, do not deal lightly with sin. But many lashes, not few lashes, but we want to seek to mortify the flesh. Romans 7, even for the Christian. I believe this is post-conversion Paul. Even for the Christian, sin still resides within the members of my being. But for the Christian, he does not deal kindly with his sin. We don't seek to subdue our sin, manage our sin, take captive and imprison and lock away our sin. Biblically speaking, we are commanded to kill our sin. And you cannot, brothers and sisters, ever kill the sin that you have not first, by grace and conviction of the Spirit, come to hate. The only sin you will ever kill by grace is the sin you have come to hate by grace. And many of us do not hate the sin of fear. We deal kindly with that sin. We write up treaties with that sin rather than declaring war on that sin. Fear is a sin. Biblically, how do we know this? A plethora of verses, but I'll give you one. Be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication make your request known to God. How many times does the scripture say, do not worry? Not, oh, I see you're worrying. That must be hard. Let's talk about it. No, stop it. Some of the best biblical counsel that, that I've ever witnessed, been given myself as I've needed it and given it to others. Some of the best biblical counsel. Somebody comes in, I, I've got this thing going, this reoccurring habit. I know that it's wrong. Some of the best biblical counsel I've ever heard is this. Stop it. Stop it. Cut that out. But pastor, that's not gospel-centered. Okay, yeah, yeah. Jesus died for your sin, so stop it. That is how the Bible writes to us. Stop worrying. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Stop it. We tolerate the sin of fear. But that's just half of the point that I'm making now. Fear is not only categorized biblically as a sin. But when fear comes upon a people, it is very often, if not almost always, a sign of not only a sin, but a curse. That a people has fallen underneath God's corporate judgment. One of the chief evidences which caused Rahab to be convinced that her people were the baddies, right? that she would make concessions with the spies of Israel, that she would switch allegiances from Jericho, which was an Amorite city, by the way. So they, they, they've conquered the Amorites. We see that in our text. We heard how you conquered these two Amorite kings. Jericho, they were also Amorites. There were seven tribes, pagan tribes in Canaan that had to be conquered and driven out. One of them were the Amorites. But even within these seven tribes, there were further subcategories of multiple tribes within these tribes. Sub-tribes, villages, cities, fortified capitals. Think of Nineveh, for instance. Nineveh was one of five capital cities of the Assyrians. Just one. Now, it was a major one. And so, too, the same kind of concept. Jericho was a major fortified. It was a juggernaut. It's not all the Amorites, because they've already taken out two kings of the Amorites. But if you take out Jericho, then essentially, effectively, 
the Amorites are finished. You'll still have to drive them out, right? You'll still have to follow it up, but that's the giant. You slay the giant and his people shudder. His people retreat and then you run them down. That's what happened with David and Goliath. Right? When David cut off Goliath's head and held it up with Goliath's own sword and fulfilled his promise to Goliath that today I will feed your carcass to the birds. When David does this, Israel doesn't say, and we're done. But effectively, it's done. They then go, and strength comes back to Israel. They were under God's judgment. They were trembling. Their knees were shaking. Every day as Goliath came out and taunted the people of God, blaspheming God, mocking Israel. But David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that mocks the armies of the living God? I will serve up his head and his carcass to the birds. And he does it. And there's still a ton of Philistines that need to be taken out. But all of a sudden, the spirit comes back to the Philistines. They're reinvigorated and they run them down. Same with Jericho and the Amorites. Most importantly, same with Jesus and the devil. Jesus in his earthly ministry, by his act of obedience, that is fulfilling all righteousness in his life, by his passive obedience, that is his substitutionary death, dying on the cross in my place, not merely as a moral example of sacrificial love, but dying as a propitiation, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. By his act of obedience and his uh, full righteous life, his passive obedience and his substitutionary death, and his bodily resurrection that God would not let his Holy One see decay, but rather rose him on the third day from the grave and his glorious, majestic, conquering ascension to the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, where he has now sat down. It is finished. And one by one, his enemies subjected under his feet. It's the same principle. What Jesus did by his life, death, resurrection, and ascension is that he came to earth and he bound the strong man. Now, the strong man still has a lot of minions left in the world. And the strong man, to make it plain, speaking of Satan, woe to you, O earth, for the devil is cast down to you. The devil was cast down to the earth. In a sense, the earth became his house. How? Well, everything that happens, happens in a covenantal framework. God is creator of all, including the earth. But God gave Adam... He gave him federal headship over the created world. Adam, by his sin, transferred that headship, his stewardship, his dominion over the world to Satan. But Jesus came, the second Adam, the last Adam, the better Adam, and he came and took it back. And he bound Satan. Now listen, Satan is bound but he has not yet been cast into the lake of fire. You might think, well, but Satan roars, like, like he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. And he's still in the business of devouring. But there's a categorical difference in real time, real human history. Something happened 2,000 years ago. Namely, God took on flesh came to the world, which the devil has been cast down to you, and bound the strong men. And as Jesus says in a parable, you cannot go and plunder the house unless someone first goes and binds the strong man. Then you plunder the goods. So just like David binds the strong man, Goliath. Doesn't mean we're done, but now we run them down. The people of Israel go and run down the rest of the Philistines. Just like Jericho, a juggernaut. You take it down, there's still Amorites and six other tribes in the land of Canaan that must be driven out. But there are heads, juggernauts, giants, dragons in the land. And when they're slain by the grace of God, empowering his people, life comes back to the people of God. The people who were previously fearful, previously shuddering, Previously unbelieving in God's promise. Now all of a sudden, there's still work to be done. My point is, the war isn't over, but the people now have courage to run to the battle. 
There is a, a war happening right now, a spiritual war with real cultural, political, physical, tangible effects in this world. People say, well, the culture war is not a thing. That is so naive. It's a spiritual war. Why not both? Yeah, it's a spiritual war. But here's the thing about spiritual wars. The spiritual war that's going on all around us that we can't see, guess what? These spirits, they actually care about the physical world. God cares because he made it. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. God cares about the physical world. You know who else does? The devil. In fact, it's a spiritual war, not a cultural one. Nope, nope. It, it is a spiritual war, but with cultural, tangible elements, effects, because the spirits that are warring care about the physical cosmos. There's only one entity I can think of that doesn't. Evangelicals. God cares. Satan cares. Democrats care. The only people who seem to be satisfied with not doing anything in any tangible, practical sense, is Christians. But you didn't get that from the Bible. I'll tell you that. Fear is a sin. But fear is more than just a sin. It's a sign of being under God's judgment. What convinced Rahab that she was the baddie and needed to switch teams, switch allegiance, to the good guys, namely the people of God, Israel, was that her people in every practical capacity had the advantage position. They had the juggernaut city. They had the defense strategies. Israel didn't even know the, land, the lay of the land. Hence, verse 1, Joshua sending out spies to investigate the land. Jericho knows all the strategic advantage fortified positions. They have more experience. They have more knowledge. They're on the defense. Israel has to come and attack. They have the fortified position. They have the artillery. Their people won't be weary from a journey, but rather they'll be nourished and well provided with victuals. At every level, they have the upper hand. But there's one thing that clues Rahab in in regards to the fact that Jericho is about to lose. That her people have every single practical advantage and yet they're afraid. Their hearts melted like wax. And Rahab, rightly, in humility and wisdom, by the Spirit of God, she rightly realizes this is supernatural fear. This isn't just any ordinary fear. This is supernatural fear. Meaning it's irrational fear. Illogical fear. It's a fear that makes no sense. The Amorites were formidable warriors. They had conquered plenty of people before. And now all of a sudden, a ragtag group of Israelites, the previous slaves in Egypt, they're going to march up on the scene without the weapons, without the supply, without the provisions, without the strength, without the rest. It's not a threat. And yet Jericho's afraid. Irrationally afraid. It's a supernatural fear that God placed upon them. And Rahab has the wisdom and humility by the grace of God to recognize it. We're the bad guys. We're the ones under God's judgment. I better switch allegiances. I better right now make concessions. And she does. And she does it by faith. Now to apply this, because you guys know I'm in the business of revelation, interpretation, application. I believe that's what good preaching is. Revelation, not I have a dream. Not I have an idea, not I have a strategy, but I have a text. The revelation is the word of God. Interpretation, exegeting the text. What does God mean by it? But that's where most evangelicals stop in their preaching. There is a third and final step, revelation, interpretation, application. How does this meaning of this 
text, Holy Spirit inspired text, apply to the people of God today? Brothers and sisters, here's how it applies. America is under God's judgment. Let me give you a couple verses. Deuteronomy 11.25. This first is to show us that what Rahab is sensing about Jericho being fearful is a fulfillment of what God had already promised through Moses. Deuteronomy 11.25. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. So God already made this promise. Not just the promise that, that, that he would empower his people to conquer the inhabitants of the land and give it to them as an inheritance, but he also promised how he would do it, at least in a general sense. One of the ways that God would do it is he would lay upon, as a sign of his judgment that destruction was coming, he would lay upon them as a precursor, a irrational, illogical, supernatural fear. God promised this through Moses, and now he's doing it in the day of Joshua. But further than this, this is how it applies to us today and other nations, not merely ours, but particularly ours. Leviticus 26, verses 6 through 25. I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down. This is God's promise and covenant to Israel. And none shall make you afraid. And I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. Times of peace, plenty, prosperity. You shall chase your enemies. You'll still have enemies, but you'll dominate your enemies. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred. Right? That, again, that, notice, this is supernatural. Right? The word that we might use for it today in the dark web of evangelicalism would be it's a psyop. Like God is going to run a psyop on the enemies of Israel. They will be irrationally afraid. Five Israelites will be able to, to chase a hundred of their enemies. Five shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. Let's pause there for a second. Do you recognize that the exact opposite is happening today? The exact opposite. Now I suspect that sadly because of the church's impotency and faith, faithlessness, that the numbers are far more even now. But there was a time in our nation not that long ago where well, we had the upper hand. But five caused a hundred evangelicals to run. God's promise is that, that when we're faithful to him, keeping steadfast covenant, that five of his people would cause a hundred of his enemies to flight. And that a hundred of his people would cause 10,000 to flight. We have seen precisely the opposite in recent decades in our nation. Precisely the opposite. Oh, I, I, well, I, I don't want to offend. Oh, they, they, you know, this person, this person criticized me. I, I, I better dial it back. I better tone it down. You know, there's, there's a debate currently being waged within evangelicalism and faithful brothers, I might add. None of them heretics. We disagree. The disagreement matters. But I do believe that by the grace of God, we are on the same team. The debate, if we were to boil it down, a lot of it comes down to this simple question. Revival or reformation, if you prefer that term, how will it come about? How will Jericho be defeated? Will it be bottom up? Meaning more churches, more planting, more preaching, more evangelism. And therefore, by God's grace, if he's pleased to do it, more conversion. And therefore, more regenerate hearts. And with more regenerate hearts, Christians being positioned with more authority and stewardship in the land. Or, that's one side of the debate. The other side is, will it be top-down and bottom-up? And for the record, no one is holding the top-down exclusive position. That's a mischaracterization. But will it be both? Bottom-up, conversion. Conversion. 
preaching, evangelism, gospel, church planting, families, kids, catechizing, training up, and, and some Christians in positions of authority strategically in the civil magistrate ruling righteously. Both. And for anyone who says you can't do both, might I point you, your attention to the Sodomites who in 40 years with less than 3% of the population effectively have traded the American flag for a rainbow. They got it done. And they did not have the numbers, but they got it done. Five of them put a hundred of us to flight. The very promise that God makes for his people all of a sudden, when his people are faithless, works against us. Now we're the ones that the PSYOP is being run on. We're the ones now who are irrationally and illogically afraid. We're the ones running. And I would say that, that five causing a hundred to flight, I don't think that's where we're at today. Let me specify that. I think today the numbers are much more even. But I would say that for the last 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, that's where we were. We actually had the numbers. So when guys say, we just need more regenerate hearts, I say, yes and amen. But we had it before. And we didn't do anything with it. So we need regenerate hearts. You know what we also need? We need some good, sound doctrine. We need regenerate hearts, but we also need theologically informed minds. Those regenerate hearts in pews, in churches, being trained and discipled by guys like Greg Bonson, who tried to warn us and was silenced. And he wasn't silenced by liberals. He was silenced by Westminster Escondido Seminary. Do not forget that. So, one of God's judgments even for his own people, if we choose to be faithless. And yes, I believe this applies, the nation Israel old covenant, I believe this applies in a New Testament sense for the church. For the church. The church will be on the retreat if the church is faithless. The church will be irrationally fearful if the church is faithless. You get the point. Let's continue Genesis 15, 13 through 16. It's the last thing that I want you to see in terms of nations. Now, this is not about Israel. And so this principle is just as good. You can take it to the bank, whether it's 2,000 years before Calvary in terms of human history or 2,000 years after where we sit today. This is speaking of the Amorites, Jericho being an Amorite city. And then the Lord said to Abraham, before Moses and Joshua were ever even born, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs and will be servants there. He's talking about slaves. He's talking about Egypt. And they will be afflicted for 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, that being Egypt, and afterward, not just judgment on Egypt, that enslaved Israel for 400 years, but afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you... You shall go to your fathers in peace. All this will happen after your lifetime. You shall be buried in a good old age and they shall come back here. That is your people, your descendants, Israel, shall come back here to the land Abraham was already in. Abraham was already in the land of Canaan. They shall come back here when they're done with their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. I'll judge Egypt, but I'll also bring Israel back here to the land of Canaan in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites, not just Egypt, is not yet complete. What God is saying is this. 400 years, your people, you're going to die here in the land of Canaan, Abraham, in a ripe old age. And you'll have a life of peace. But after you, there's some things that I'm going to bring about. One of them will be that Israel will be in captivity and slavery in Egypt for 400 years. But then I will redeem them. And when I redeem them, I will judge their captors, Egypt, and I will resource Israel by plundering their possessions. But then I will bring Israel from that land of Egypt that I have now judged after 400 years and I'll bring Israel back to where you're standing right now, Abraham. The promised land. Where the Amorites are. Remember Jericho. Amorite capital city. 
I'll bring them back here. And not only will I judge Egypt to deliver them, I'll then judge the Amorites and the Canaanites in order to, that they might inherit the land. But then he says this, the reason, one of the reasons that it will take 400 years is because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God is slow to anger, abounding in love, and relenting in sending disaster for those who call upon his name and repent. God is not a God who indefinitely tolerates evil. And God is not a God who never gets angry. But he is a God who gets appropriately angry at the right time for the right things in the right measure. And God, because he is abundantly patient and kind, his anger is slow. But eventually, if a nation does not repent, his anger is eventually poured out. God judged the Amorites, and even in an Old Testament paradigm, before the cross of Jesus Christ, you see the long-suffering and patience of God. In a corporate nature, with a nation, tolerating them for 400 years, that they might repent, and Nineveh did. But this particular nation, the Amorites, God knew that they wouldn't. And so for 400 years, God was well within his rights to destroy them. But he allowed them to build, to basically build God's list of justification for his judgment by fulfilling further and further iniquity. And then he judged them. And that applies to all nations. That is not a unique principle applied to the covenant nation state of Israel in the Old Testament. That is a principle of corporate judgment for all nations, whether it's before the cross or after. And no nation today is exempt, including ours. Right now, the Lord is allowing our nation to fill up its iniquity. But he will judge us. We have been a superpower. In many ways, better than thinking of us as a nation, we have functioned as an empire, much like Rome. But we're getting weak. We're fracturing, imploding, dividing, filling up our iniquity. There was a time where American military was feared throughout the world and still is at some level. But I'm telling you that if America does not corporately repent and explicitly pledge its allegiance to the triune Christian God, not just a conservative resurgence in principle, but a Christian revival in person, calling upon the person of Jesus Christ. If that does not occur, it may be 40 more years, it may be 400, but we will fill up our iniquity. And one of the signs will be that all of a sudden, we who once were known as a Christian nation and, and would strike terror and to other nations that did not fear the Lord, we all of a sudden will have a hundred of our military on the run from five. 10,000 from a hundred. God is not indefinitely tolerant. He is slow to his anger, but he does not possess no anger. I believe that the fearfulness of our nation right now, not just its anger, not just its division, not just the insanity, but there is an underlining sense of dread. And that is not only a sin, but a sign of a curse. It symbolizes that corporately, a nation has been placed under God's judgment. And like Rahab, it should drive us to make concessions now. And not just concessions with Israel as Rahab did, but in the truest sense, Rahab was making concessions with God. With God. I would rather be with God against Jericho than with Jericho against Israel's God. And so too, let it begin with the church in America. Let us pave the way for repentance. We've got plenty of our own sin to repent for. Let us repent. Not just turning back to more conservative principles, not just trying to get back to the 80s, but actually calling upon Jesus by name and demanding that the state do the same 
that Caesar is a servant and that there is a God above him. The state is not God. Christ is God. And that we must call upon him and repent of our sin. Make concessions now with the Lord of hosts who alone is mighty to save and who is merciful, relenting from sending disaster. And here we have our final point that in this chapter, we see a beautiful foreshadowing of the gospel. The final verse in our text says this, then she sent them away, that being the Israelite spies, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Rahab entered into a covenant with the nation of Israel and their God through faith alone. However, there was no delay. Catch this church, three minutes and I'm done. There was no delay between Rahab's inward faith and her immediate outward obedience. She believed and then immediately obeyed by participating in the covenant sign. In and of itself, this scarlet thread hung from her window was seemingly insignificant. But as a sign of the promise, it was saving. Insofar as it symbolized the promise, inward trust in Yahweh and his covenant, this thread saved her and her household. This was a small sign of obedience, yet it was a visible sign. The scarlet thread did not point inward to her own people, Jericho, her natural kin according to the flesh, but instead it pointed outside the city walls, not towards her kin according to the flesh, but towards the people of God, her true kin according to the promise. John Gill, the late great Baptist theologian, in commentating on this very point and this very text, says the following. Now as Rahab was an instance of the salvation of sinners by the grace of God, for she was a sinner by birth, by practice, and a notorious one, a prostitute. She was an instance of distinguishing grace, a free and efficacious grace, a singular instance of it, and became a true penitent, that is repentant, and real believer. She was justified, a justified person, and saved. So the scarlet thread, therefore, signified an emblem of the blood of Christ. We are not saved by works, and we are not saved by outward signs of the covenant. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But insofar as covenantal signs as a scarlet thread or as your public baptism, insofar as they truly represent inward faith, then you bet your bottom dollar baptism saves. That scarlet thread saved Rahab and her whole household. It could not save them apart from faith. It only saved them insofar as it outwardly represented faith. And so it is with us. We serve a covenant God, and we enter into that covenant by faith alone. But with that covenant come signs and seals. And these seals do not point inward to our natural kin according to the flesh, fellow sinners from whom we are leaving, but it points outward. It points outward to the people of God, our kin, according to the promise by the Spirit, but not just outward to the church, to God's people, but the sign of baptism, the sign of the Lord's Supper that we're about to partake in now, these covenantal signs, just as the sign of the scarlet thread with Rahab, first and foremost, doesn't merely point outward to God's people, but outward to the heavens, to God himself. It reminds God of his promise. Just as he set his bow in the sky, remembering his covenant never to flood the earth again after the days of Noah, so too in our baptism, immersed in water, reminds God, the God of heaven, that we as Noah was sealed up in the ark, which is Christ, that we have passed safely through the waters of God's judgment and that Christ suffered God's judgment for our sin and that his wrath no longer remains for us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Bless it to your people and bring great glory to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.